Oh, Jesus, if I keep listening to that cliff, it's, cliff, it's going to set me off again. That is uh, emotional. Anyway, look, I've been dying to uh, talk about this. Uh, I'll keep the tissues handy just in case I need a quick stealth cry. Um, but, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the main event. It's time to discuss the MCU was back this week. Again, we're, not going to, we're in that stage where we get a, a little bit nervous when it gets to these movies now again, if it's going to live up to the, the massive amount of hype and expectation we put into them. Uh, this was a big one, though. Uh, the last in the Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy before director James Gunn heads off to DC. And obviously, a lot of the cast have said this is our last one. They made no secret about it. Uh, trailer promised a lot, promised a lot of emotion. Uh, did it live up to it while well, joining me to discuss it? Don't worry, this isn't a trap. It's a face-off. Uh, I'm being joined by the one and only Dan Lynham. Dan, how are you doing? Are you are you able to gonna be able to get through this like without having a cry as well as me? Or are we both kind of on the razor's edge here? No, I've been emotionally destroyed by society, as you well know. So uh, <laughs> I like to think of myself as a empathetical sort of sociopath. So <laughs> Uh, I, I I try a little bit harder than your regular like maniac to okay. to understand everyone else's emotions. But luckily, my partner Kelly was there yesterday, and she did all the crying for me, being an animal lover herself. <laughs> it was a roller coaster for her. So um, right. I I, just, I stayed true to the nerd them, and I was seeing what I could like kind of pull out of the movie. So I'm dying to discuss it with you. Okay. The empathetic sociopath. I love it. Just sitting there like they're there, human. <laughs> yeah. I, need more nicknames. I mean, like <laughs> hell, the crimson demon, the gobshite that lives around a corner. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Good stuff. Well, guys, spoiler warning. If you haven't seen guardians, you're not in a safe space, okay? This is going to be a spoiler-filled version. It's called Into the Spoilerverse for a reason, guys. Uh, so be very careful if you haven't seen Guardians of the Galaxy vol Volume 3. Guys, go off and watch it. Come back, listen to us, and listen to our review on it because from here on out, we're going to be talking freely. We're also going to be talking about the other Guardians movies, the rest of the MCU. We're going to talk about some comic book lore and stuff like that as well. Again, as per usual, we're not here to ruin anything for you. We're not here to spoil anything in particular. We're just here to add some context to kind of enhance your enjoyment of what you've seen or give you some background on maybe some characters so you, you can look forward to them. Uh, we're going to have a full discussion, but before we do, what we're going to do is we're going to look at where we've been and remind ourselves and put ourselves back into that emotional scene. I'm going to try to get through this without crying. It is time for our old recap of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And the Guardians had barely finished. One Radiohead track on Nowhere by the time they were thrust into action after an attack from Adam Warlock attempting to kidnap Rocket leaves them needing intensive care. They they travel to Orgo Corp, which sounds like what websites will end in when we use up every .com and .ie. Uh, while Comatose Rocket's life flashes before his eyes from Raccoon to Science Experiment to Murderer. You know, that old chestnut. We learn how the High Evolutionary used to help him forge, used him to help forge a perfect new world before trying to murder him and successfully murdered all of his friends when they tried to escape because, you know, just experimenting on ad animals doesn't quite hit for someone attempting to be evil genes. New Gamora, who's now hanging out with the Ravagers, offers a reluctant assist, which prompts Quill to try and get her to rekindle the memories that only he has. It's a bit like a peppier version of the Notebook, to be honest. Uh, they track down the High Evolutionary on Counter-Earth, only to find he's planning to self-destruct the whole thing and start again with the knowledge that he can get by retrieving Rocket. Quill barely escapes with Groot because apparently talking trees can fly now, and they're able to extract the passcode to override Rocket's kill switch. It sounds techy, but it was really probably one of the most emotional moments in MCU history. Nebula, Mantis and Drax, however, are trapped on the high evolutionary shift with a bunch of Juju kids. I'm not being anti-Semitic there, by the way. That's what they're actually called. Uh, Juju kids is their name, okay? I'm not saying that, right? Turns out the guy with the Messiah complex doing experiments to give animals sentience and kidnapping children is crazy. Shock horror. His crew realizes only for him to vaporize them almost immediately. However, the Guardians unite with Kraglin, Cosmo, and the rest of the B team coming in for the save to free the kids and animals and to kill the high evolutionary with Adam Warlock saving Quill from freezing in space because they paid Will Poulter a lot of money and not really given him much significant to do to that point if we're being honest uh, after one final adventure the guardians went their separate ways quill went back to earth to hang out with his granddad keep it keeping getting those kevin feige checks instead of jumping ship to dc mantis to have her wild college years rockets to need the new look guardians nebula and drax to look after nowhere and the mcu wondering what the fuck they're supposed to do now the one guy capable of making an amazing marvel movie is 
also run their competitor studio because from now on you can come and get your love in dc and that is guardians of the galaxy volume three very interesting and like i said i get nervous now going into mcu movies i was with this because guardian holds a very special place in my heart and i know i'm far from alone in saying that what were your thoughts dan on guardians of the galaxy volume three did they nail this did they miss where, where are you at for this where's it sitting with you best marvel movie of this saga probably the only one that came close to me and because spider-man would be a character near and dear to my heart it would be no way home yep. no way home was the last kind of great epic that really kind of did a lot of universe building what I loved about Guardians was it was the first time in ages we got what felt really felt like a self-contained Marvel movie. There was no major tie-ins to the greater cinematic universe. And that was a breath of fresh air. And I didn't really realize that until I'd left the cinema. I really just liked that. It was just a classic space opera in of itself with a shit ton of fan service for people who, like me, grew up on Lost in Space, uh, the original Battlestar Galactica, and the homage was there. Loads of stuff I liked, the Gen X era music, and that I really only noticed as they're moving along, that we had the 70s movie in the first one, 80s in the second. It was should have been way more obvious, but this the 90s soundtrack, Fate No More and stuff like that, mm. loved it made for me a really felt movie was made for me and the more i've reflected on it the more i've realized how much i enjoyed it yeah i like i said i get really nervous going to mcu movies day these days because again i i don't think they've had awful movies but it just hasn't lived up to the the standards that they set with phase three but they absolutely killed this this looked aesthetically incredible and it was very on brand for the guardians it felt Total Guardians, it felt like they really went for it and, and they weren't afraid. All actors were totally bought in. The core characters were given time to breathe. They got the timing so right and got everyone to have their moment. They managed to land the emotional story without sacrificing the goofy humor that kind of got us there to begin with. Uh, I, I didn't know if I liked the co concept of them being a family with a home in nowhere and kind of have that base uh, when we were watching the Christmas special, but I absolutely loved it here. And I, I like... I'm just devastated that it's over because I'm like, I finally feel like I've got into it all. Like, again, I finally feel like I'm like, I'd watch this every year. I'd watch a TV show. I'd watch a Disney Plus show. This is what I want. And this is like, you know, uh, The Guardians is my favorite franchise, like probably outside the Avengers movies themselves. It's my favorite Marvel standalone franchise. And I'm just devastated it's over. But again, they nailed so much of this. The, the soundtrack, again, have to echo what you said there. And yes, I totally agree. The fact that they kept it away from a lot of the multiverse stuff I think there was only one reference to kind of multiversal stuff with kind of the Gamora stuff but even then it was only <laughs> tangential and, and the fact they kept it away from that and they didn't try and fit in like backdoor pilots for 50 different movies meant yes. they could just focus on this story and it was phenomenal and it was it was invigorating for me to see that and I really hope that Marvel has an, a, an interesting time ahead because it was an interesting movie to come ahead and maybe the right time because obviously you see all the stuff. The next few years are roadmapped around Kang or so we think. Now Jonathan yes. Majors is getting yeah. in a lot of trouble. And again, it's nothing against like Jonathan Majors or Kang in particular and, and his performance. Like we were, we were singing Kang's praises coming out of Iron Man. Though obviously he may not be a good dude if a lot of this stuff is true. But yep. We were quite happy to go down the Kang road, but again, we were nervous about the films and what they were sacrificing to do this. This is maybe a timely lesson at a time they need to learn it, that we just want stories. We just want a two and a half hour film that's just good. We don't care about how it ties into the bigger picture. And really, that's what they used to give us in the MCU. And that's what this reminded me of. They give us this self-contained movie. And then we get the world building in the post-credits scenes. And that's we were fine with that because they were just extra scenes. And mm -hmm. they didn't take away from the movie, even if they were a bit off kilter. And that's what this gave us. And I really, really loved it. It was really exciting. But let's get into the, the weeds of it all. Let's first talk about Gamora. Um, because she had the return, her return. And... To be honest, I was very, I wasn't mad about the marketing around this because I felt I didn't like how they just gave it away in the trailers that she was back, considering that it was one of the big mysteries coming out of Endgame and they didn't give it away in Thor Love and Thunder. They didn't give it away in the Christmas special. And then in the trailers, we're like, oh, Gamora's back. And it's it's like, oh, what is that? Why, why are you giving away your main thing? 
But what did you think about in execution? Did they land this? How did it feel with Gamora being back? And and obviously, but not the Gamora that we knew. There was one thing that I didn't want from this. And this was like, you know, your cliche kiss at the end and then everything's back to normal and it undoes everything. Big fan of a slow burn. And I think if you're a fan of comics or comic book movies, that that's something that you have to accept. Um, they really held off on the evolution of this kind of part of the character because it is a new Gamora. This whole thing, like you could see uh, Peter not understanding the whole context of it because he's so love struck and with the whole situation of that. It's it's not his Gamora. It is because it's a past version of herself, but she hasn't had the experiences to grow into the person that he fell in love with. Mm. So the fact that they could have just very easily just done the payoff and done the kiss and then they're back together. But the parting at the end, standing back to back, that sort of a revelation that there may be something there from her and that he's wondering if he should move on. That's what I wanted. I didn't want, you know, something that was just pointless. That would have upset the character building they did. So I was really happy with that. To be honest with you, the Gamora, how will she make it back, wasn't really something that I was wondering about too much. I just kind of assumed that she would show up, that she was on a mission similar to kind of the one that Peter was on in the in the first uh, Guardians movie yeah. or something like that. But the fact that she teamed up with the Ravagers and then they just were used as mercenaries that was fine for me. Uh, I think she needed to get into it quickly, but I love the dissension they created with her just being so pissed off with Quills, just belligerent badging of her. Just we have to be together. We have to rekindle what we had. He remembers it. It never happened for her. She's, she has, she never had a chance to evolve into the woman that he fell in love with. Yeah, I totally agree. I, as I, I, I kind of, there was a bit of a deception there because I kind of made it seem like I didn't love this. I didn't love it in the build up and I didn't love the trailer side of it. But when I watched it, I'm like, you know what? I can't fault the movie for its marketing because they don't get to decide what goes in the trailer. They don't get to decide how the movie's marketed. And the way they, they did it was excellent. I totally agree with everything you said. It was so nicely played. I love the way they didn't go where everyone wanted. Exactly just echoing what you said. Um, It was so ambitious, but also like there was enough there. But what I loved about it as well was that it allowed the the Quill storyline to be a side storyline. And it was played for laughs a lot of the time as well. And that let him move out of the way for everyone else to step up, you know? But it didn't, like, relegate him. You never felt like they were de-pushing Chris Pratt, you know what I mean? Or, or, yeah. or like, he was still a very crucial part of the story, but it also just let everyone else get their get their say in because we've seen two movies where Chris Pratt is the guy and and that's fine like and there's nothing wrong with that and that got us to where we needed to be but we've seen his origin story we still want something from him and this was enough and playing it for laughs let the emotional heart of the movie lie elsewhere which I think it really really benefited from so I was a big fan in how they paid it off and it was kind of a like but a foresight into one of the big moments we're obviously going to get when Secret Wars come, which is going to be their first kiss, you know, yeah. when they rekindle. And like, you know, you, you have to see these movies in day one. The crowd reaction now has become such a pivotal point uh, when you go to see these in the cinema. So when they finally do have their big romantic moment, you know the crowd's going to erupt. Yeah, And that's clearly what they're doing. Giving it away in this wouldn't have had the same impact. And it's going to be awesome when they do get a chance to do it in be a Kang Dynasty, but it, it's something that they could really hold off and even build and tease. And people will be gullible to still say, will they, won't they? But we know what's happening in Secret Wars. Two years away, got loads of time to build it. And it's going to work. Yeah, it's going to be great. I can't wait. Um, Marvel has often said to have a villain problem. This time we got the High <laughs> Evolutionary. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts on how they brought this character in and is this one of is this going alongside Thanos for you, or is this just another forgettable Marvel villain? How did how did this work for you? Uh, I thought I, I do think kind of it's going to be forgettable. He wasn't the star of the show the way some villains are in the Marvel movies. Um, one thing that I have to completely admit here is that when it comes to Marvel comics, one of the subgenres that I don't enjoy as much as some of the other ones is the cosmic stuff. Okay, you know, read like the big ones. Uh, Annihilation probably being the most recent one, which I actually did enjoy, but sometimes it's too hokey for me. And what this did is, I think it brought the hokiness out. 
But like, um, but it, it did it really well, especially with the outfits and some of the humor and even some of the designs and stuff. Still pissed off after look at Howard the Duck because <laughs> just that like it reminds me of the original film, which I did have the displeasure of seeing when I was a kid. So um I do think like the high evolutionary, I wouldn't say he was hokey himself. Yeah. Uh he's a lot more methodical and sinister in the comics. Um but in this he was how would you say it? He was not your classic mustache twirling villain, but more of uh what you would see like it was it was gonna be the eventual madman character, you know, the, like I don't know who you could compare it to, but uh, he, he felt like he was definitely going down the insane route. Okay, you could argue he's already there, but I'm talking about more so in his mannerisms and stuff and his explosiveness, which I don't really recall seeing in the comics. He was very calculating and almost robotic from the few stories I've seen him in. Uh, but be, like I said, being honest, it's not a character I've read a lot of, yep. but I liked his portrayal in this movie. The one thing I was bummed about is that uh, Quill actually made the reference to Robocop, and I was really proud of myself in the cinema for going to Kelly. He was like, the back of his head is a spit image of Murphy's <laughs> Robocop 1. And I was like, I'm going to say this in the podcast. Everyone's going to go, wow, good reference. And I'm going to everything by bringing it up. So I was disgusted at that. But I did appreciate the Skeletor reference being a big key man fan. So. Nice. Love it. Love it. Yeah, I, I thought he was serviceable. I thought he did what he yeah. needed to do. Like, I, I think this needed to be... You'll always need a villain. You'll always need an antagonist in a movie like this. It's just par for the course. And it's part of the formula. But what we wanted was something to focus our characters on. And the story did it. And he played his his part in that. And he was able to kind of step up and be menacing when he needed to be. But also we needed a villain here. It wouldn't have worked to have a Thanos or a Loki or even a Zemo. You needed someone who could just get out of the way when they needed to and let us focus on the characters and the relationships that we wanted to, you know what I mean? So I thought he, he did his role. Again, I don't think it was iconic by any means, but like, again, perfectly fine. And and, and the actor as well was did a, did a fine yeah. job with it. Um, another interesting swing they took was uh, bringing Adam Warlock into this. This mm -hmm. is someone who is like, you know, we saw in the very end, he's now joined the new Guardians team and is very much kind of like has a love-hate kind of relationship with the Guardians throughout the, the comic books. An interesting choice that they made, obviously, was to have him be uh, played by Will Poulter, obviously mm -hmm. more known for comic acting and played, the, played it a bit for laughs here as well, whereas... You know, Adam Warlock is portrayed in various different ways, whether you go to comics or whether you go to video game and so on. Um, which, But it, this was kind of a new kind of portrayal of that. How did you feel about the portrayal here? Do you feel it stayed true to the character? How did you feel they did you feel they did Adam Warlock justice or was this an interesting kind of, um, you know, stance to take on him? Definitely the latter, because I they didn't stay true to Adam Warlock at all. Yeah, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like I said in the last one, um, if you look at, at Thanos as a character compared to the comics, he was completely different to the comics. It, he was like a laughing, like he kind of it's a bit of an oxymoron, but he was a clever buffoon. Mm. Uh, he was silly essentially. I think that's the best word to sum it up. But he yeah. was not that in the Infinity Saga, and. Same way, kind of like, I guess you compare it to Heat Ledger's Joker. Heat Ledger's Joker is not the Joker from the comics, but like Thanos, it worked. And I think Adam Warlock worked here. The thing that's interesting is obviously that in the comics, during the Infinity uh, the Infinity Gauntlet story in the comics, Adam Warlock is a key player. So his tease at the end of Volume 2, everyone assumed it was going to play into what we knew at the time was going to be the Infinity Saga. He's going to have some connection to the gauntlet everyone was expecting him still to show up at endgame and to maybe fill the role that uh captain marvel filled at, at the end of that film to be the big bad because in the infinity gauntlet the comic he is more of a superhero or sorry, excuse me superhero superman style character uh very kind of sage very wise very goal driven that's not what we got, but that's not a bad thing. He reminded me more so as a, as a character of the century from the kind of last like fifteen years of um, the Avengers comics. So if you, no one is aware of the century, he's basically 
a schizophrenic uh, superhero who uh, is both his villain and, uh, and and the hero of his own story. Really interesting character. Character like the character a lot of comic fans didn't really like. Mm. He's kind of he's so powerful that he like Superman underestimates power, and that's the buzz I got off Adam Warlock in this because he's incredibly powerful. We've seen that displayed several times throughout the film. But that's not who the Adam Warlock we knew was. Uh, so whether he's going to kind of fill the role of Adam Warlock in the century, and the fact that his peak key purpose in the comics originally was to do with the Infinity Stones, it's unusual bringing him in. But one thing I noticed is that the Guardians of the Galaxy game, which was released yeah. not that long ago, he was way more closer to that interpretation of the character, which I liked. There was a, a comedic uh, naivety to him that was very fun, especially the fact that he was a, still a child, but grown up. Once again, a weird reference to make, he reminded me a bit more of what they were trying to do with Lino in the original Thundercats cartoon. Mm. You know, someone with a lot of responsibility trust upon them yeah. because they have the outer appearance of an adult, but they still have the mentality of a child. Yeah. So it was an interesting direction to take him in. I think it works. I still would have liked to have seen the original interpretation, but you have to diverge from the from the source material to yeah. create a new universe. So I'm cool with it. Yeah, it, the, the one thing that I'd say, and it's I like the portrayal of it. I like the twist on it. I like the fact he is just a child, um, and he has that childlike sensibility. Like when uh, his mother's telling him, like you know, teach him a lesson, and he just destroys the guy. Mm-hmm. He's like, I, I taught him a lesson. It's like, no, he doesn't learn anything. He's dead now. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, I just didn't feel like there was room for him in this movie. Like, and that was kind of the only issue that I had because on the more of them, you know, there was times you forgot he was there. Like when he saved. Yeah. Or you're like, oh shit, yeah, Adam Warlock's here. There. I'm like, yeah, oh fuck. Um, so like it was, you know, I I kind of you felt the redemption was coming once the the high evolutionary killed his mom. So you're like, okay, right, we we see where this is going, and we know obviously if you know enough about the lore, you know Adam Warlock. He's he's kind of like um. Sorry, I'm I'm blanking here. Uh, on on the the villain from the most recent from Wakanda Forever, um, Namor. Um, he's very like the way he'll kind of team with. He'll be a good guy and bad guy. He'll kind of flip mm-hmm. back and forth. Um, yeah. but so you kind of knew they they were gonna do both then, but then he just never did really. He showed up towards the end because they needed him there to do one specific thing, and now he's in the new Guardians. It's interesting because again they're kind of insisting that this is the end of the Guardians, but also in the post credit scenes they gave us a new look Guardians. And why would you bring Will Poulter in? Why would you do this kind of character building without any payoff, and then throw him in this crew if you're we're not going to see the rest? I don't think we're going to see any more Guardians movies, but yeah, we're going to see them kind of pop up in new Avengers movies and so on. I think like it's definitely not the last we've seen of that iteration of the Guardians, and not the last of him. And I'm a fan of him, but again, I just feel that there wasn't enough space for kind of a new character that he wanted to bring. If we had a fourth movie, we could have the Adam Warlock movie. And then if he played a bit part in the final movie, that would make sense. So um yeah, it was just it I was the one that, kind yeah. of it was the one bit of a whiff or a nitpick I had, but otherwise in a movie that I loved. Um we had some huge arcs for lead characters. So everyone went on a, on an arc, even if it was just a personal journey or some kind of sense of achievement or kind of a big journey. So you had Nebula taking on a leadership role. You had Drax understanding metaphors now. And uh, you had Groot speaking towards the end. Oh, there's a lot of theories. And one theory that I like is that he Breaking didn't... Breaking kayfabe, speak. let's call it what it is. Yeah, he they broke totally kayfabe. Broke kayfabe. He, he, totally. He's like, hello, Cole Cabana. Yeah, there you go. It's like, come on, man. Um, <laughs> but I did hear a theory out there where it's like that isn't because the previous scene before that was Gamora realized she le- understood Groot and the theory that I heard out there was that no we the audience are now Gamora we understand Groot so mm-hmm. we now speak Groot but he in actuality he just said I am Groot maybe that's just me my, making myself feel better uh, we've got Rocket being the heart you have James Gunn coming out this week saying yeah Rocket actually was the sneaky league character of Guardians we just didn't know he's the only person who survived the, the blip and so on and then you have Mal- Mantis and Quill trying to kind of rediscover who they are what was your favorite bit of character development what was your favorite arc that, that uh they that, that went on in this movie without being kind of too obvious about the whole thing it was probably rocket because like the flashbacks were fantastic uh even the fan service with the name delivery at the end because for the whole entirety of every movie he was featured in he was fighting against the fact that he was 
a raccoon, that he was a rodent, that he was a squirrel, whatever they were calling him. Yeah. And like, you know, he has had his solo comics, which are Rocket Raccoon. You know, and um, for him to kind of take that on at the end, and it was such a sweet way to doing it, discovering the cage, the baby raccoons, it was brilliant. I and I love that we finally did get to see um the trauma gone through, and the big kind of payoff for that one was when Nebula compared her trauma that we'd seen in in parts straight to movies to what Rocket had experienced, saying that what he went through was nothing compared to what I went through. And that really solidified it. And the the off-screen shots of the experimentation, and then we see the aftermath. It was very... It, like, the Marvel movies are supposed to be family films, but I don't know if this one is something that a lot of parents would have been happy bringing their kids to. Um, A lot of, like, pretty violent scenes, and essentially you're watching animal torture. And... It, this isn't like you don't sign up for cannibal holocaust this is you know <laughs> supposed to be a family film um so I, I would have to say as far as the arcs go rocket was good but I, I saying that I, I loved seeing peter basically become his own character because he's always been you know the clown that needed acceptance and for him to leave at the end is good but unlike i already touched on his acceptance that not only is he not the team itself but he's also not just his relationship that it seems to have made peace with that. Um, I do kind of get a bit peeved when I, I see characters almost die, die, and then kind of be resurrected, and he came mm. right close to death's door. I understand why he did it, but if you're going to set something up like that, act on it. Um, what what was the payoff of him nearly dying apart from a, a an audience reaction? So... I would have liked maybe if it didn't look like for because are, are they gonna kill him? Is he dead? And I it, that did enter my mind for a second. Um, so that was one thing that I don't know if I was totally cool with. I I think they could have done it like less visually. Like oh my god, maybe he could have had some form of eternal monologue, life flash for his eyes thing, and then be saved. But the whole like the fact that it looked like he was dying, especially so we see Yondo go through that exact like you know kind of the death scene and the peter was there for him to go through it as well i don't know that was one thing that i had a bit of a nitpick with uh but as a character that did irritate me a little bit especially in the second one which is not one of my favorite marvel movies i have to admit massive kurt russell fan uh so i was i i preferred the ravengers part of of volume two as opposed to the ego stuff so i liked what they did with peter in this one Okay. Star Lord, the legendary Star Lord, as well. A little bit of fan service, like going straight for like the comic name at the end there. Um, then that's the thing with with the post credit scene. Are we gonna see a Star Lord movie? Like a not a Guardians one, a Star Lord one. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. Why why would they deliver the name in that way? Yeah, well, there's no major payoff or stand around. Yeah, interesting. That that that's part we will discuss the post credits because I definitely do want to discuss that. I agree with what you say about the the death scene. Again, like I'm, I'm not going to hold it against it because yeah. you know I didn't want to see I didn't want to see him die. So I'm like, okay, look, this is fine. This stuff happens in comic movies. It's okay, but it just took me out of the kind of realism of the moment. And also, I I get why they didn't because the the, the big twist in the post credit scene was he's still he's still staying around. It's like he's not going anywhere. He's sticking with Marvel. Okay, great. But then why not kill Drax? You know, why not have the exact same thing happen, but with Drax? You know what I mean? Because again, we know that he, Bati like Dave Batista's gone. Like he is officially gone. He said goodbye to Drax. He wasn't quiet about it. So I was expecting a big death here and I was expecting yeah, that emotional moment. Then it gave me loads of emotional moments. Don't get me wrong. The end, like the whole like Florence and the Machine dog days are over bit. Like that part just killed me. And I love seeing all of our characters end happily. So again, not something I'm necessarily mad at, but I'm very much the same as yourself. If you're going to tease it, you know what I mean? If you're going to tease me, then fuck me. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. like, just, just fucking do it. If you're going to just commit, if you're going to do it or don't go that way at all, because again, yeah, it just felt a bit cheap. It's like, uh, that last Jedi scene where Leia's like, we see Leia die. And then all of a sudden she just, it's like, Oh no, wait, I'm actually not going to die. Uh, no, I'm actually, I'm all good for dying today. That's just not going to happen. And you're just like, Oh, all right, fair enough. Death um, of Superman syndrome. It, it's uh, any comic fan knows it's one of the worst things ever. It, uh, 
it rewrote the rules and unfortunately that's one of the elements that bled into the comic book movies yeah. but i think a lot of the original fans would have liked if that state if you're gonna kill someone kill them yeah uh, i know there's obviously rumblings about like an alter universe tony stark coming through just if you're gonna kill a character commit yeah yeah, and, and it just make it. make these moments matter and make our emotional yeah. payoff matter. Like, yeah, I agree with that. I loved for me, yeah, Rocket being the star, absolutely loved it. Him and Nebula being the leaders. Also, I think that makes sense. And there's a little payoff there because if you look at it, him and Nebula are now the mature ones and they're the leaders of the group and they're the heart of the group. It's not a coincidence that they're the ones who had to survive and go through the blip. They had to ha grow, have that maturity and have that kind of level of growth and had to come through all of that where the rest didn't and they can afford to be a bit more silly. They didn't really touch on that, but I just kind of filled in the blanks myself there. And again, we, we saw parts of that happen, you know, in game, in end game and the like. So really enjoyed their arcs and, and kind of where they went. Um, but yeah, and obviously we spoke about Quill already and, and kind of like the, the chase where it was kind of in the backseat. So that was also something I was a big fan of. Um, I would have liked a little bit more done with Drax again. I just feel like there was, with Batista being the only person who's like, I'm definitely done. This is it. Goodbye, sir. I'm like, right, well, you can do what you want now. You know what I mean? And like, this is the one person we know we're definitely saying goodbye to, whereas everyone else we wouldn't be surprised to see them pop up. Maybe no, there's not going to be another Guardians movie. I do believe they're going to stick with that, at least unless they, at least until they're ready to do a reboot of a lot of these franchises. Um, but I do think we're going to see a lot of them in the future Avengers movies and maybe a future Star Lord movie. Um, but let's talk about that because we had the post credit scenes. We too. Um, yeah, I felt like such a child, and I'm like, I'm a 35 year old man in the cinema by myself. But literally, when they had like the uh, the legendary Star Lord will return, I literally had like, and I can't remember ever having an actively loud gasp when I was being serious, but I actually went. <gasps> <laughs> yeah. like at that time and then like I noticed a couple of people looked over at me I'm like shut up it's important <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> it's a weird post credit scene well I, yeah the, the the first one was what it was it was yeah. a setup for what they're going to do and I think what they did with the Guardians in Love and Thunder is what they're going to do now with this rocket led team going mm. forward I think they're going to be you know the the special guest appearance team. And I think that's just the way it is. Yeah. So they'll show up when someone needs an assistance. So like yeah. get them on the turtle com and that'll be it. So that was what it was. It was pretty straightforward. But what I loved about going to the cinema, and it's going to be different for everyone, is the people that were all sitting around us were the proper fans waiting for the second pros credit scene. Mm. And then everyone left, you know, the, 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 the just re regular cinema goers. Come on. And I heard this, in unison, what the fuck was that? Once the scene had ended, because they were expecting something big to happen. And I've been actually trying to wrap my head around it. And I'm talking to one of the guys I work with who's a big comic book fan as well this yeah. morning. And saying to him, is there something that we missed here? And no one seems to have noticed anything. And the only thing that sticks out aside from the gags on the newspaper was this 45-year-old out mowing the lawn that they focused on, and I was like, right, okay, you know, it's classic real movies, you bring something up, you bring it up for a reason. I think I figured it out. Okay. It's Blade. It has to be Blade. Because no. if you're a vampire and you can do anything, or like you can go out in the in the sun, you're going to go out and mow your lawn. So, <laughs> I'm just calling them now. Everyone's going to call me a maniac. It's, it's Blade. <laughs> They've done the quick little shot of him at the end of Eternals. You know, yeah, there's voiceover. Yeah. He's mowing someone's lawn out enjoying the sun. Call me mad, but that's it. It's Blade. Okay, I'm loving the the theories between this and Succession. We're getting all the the crackpot <laughs> theories here. I'm absolutely loving it. Uh, yeah, big fan of that. Um, do, do do you think we're getting like a full Star Lord movie? Is that where you think we're going, or do you think it's it, again he's going to be kind of there for an assist or a team up? We're setting it up because we know what movies are coming. There is yeah. a gap at the. The latter part of phase eight though that we don't know what's going on and obviously i think a lot of the fans kind of are theory crafting there's gonna be another spider-man movie and there's that's gonna be the x-men movie so that's mm -hmm. why they're not announcing them could the star lord movie fit in there yes will it be there i no, i don't think so i okay. think it's gonna be in the next saga 
in okay. phase nine or whatever you do after that. Okay. Go get a TV show. Uh, yeah. Look, show. The whole movie was was a love letter to uh, space operas, uh, especially the TV ones. So were they experimenting with the idea visually that a Star Lord uh, self contained story could work as a TV show on Disney Plus? Yeah. You know, a week to week, you know, like adventures through space with. Uh, like a uh, Mandalorian in the Star Wars universe, but with a lot more comedy. Okay, or like they could do a complete face shift. Like they could just do like a Hawkeye type thing, where it's like, oh, I did not expect this run. Like, what is this? Mm. Like, so yeah, you wouldn't know. Or they could do him like having these superpowers, but he's on Earth. You know, they like they made a big deal about him coming back to Earth. So what if he does an Earth based TV show or something like that? We don't know. So there's a lot of different ways it could go. It's interesting. I do like the idea of it being a TV show. If it's movie appearances, all of these guys, I want them to be team ups. I want them to now be supplementary characters who boost out the like. Like again, I want them to just respect that this is the end. But again, like they could easily just you can see them totally rolling back and just be like, no, that was the end for James Gunn. Like that's he's gone. Like that's it. But like these these are our characters. So um yeah, and look, if they do roll back as much as I'll be like, right, that that betrayed my kind of emotional reaction. I'm like, I do love these guys though. So <laughs> they, they they'll get me if they if they do. Um, but we are talking about kind of James Gunn and the end of him. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to kind of focus on as well, because on one hand, this is a great Marvel movie that we've seen and we all got to enjoy and get that old school special Marvel feeling there. But also it's the end of this franchise. And I kind of want to know that with James Gunn moving on, how much of this was a win for the MCU or how much of this was more of an ad for the DCU? Because it's it's an interesting yeah. dichotomy here. He obviously loves the franchise, and that was very evident in this film. Uh, I think he has earned the right to to make this movie, like we said, self-contained. And I'd say there was a lot of pressure from the studio to put in all these hints to what else to what what they're doing. You hear about this all the time, like, "Oh no, you need your product placement here. We need you to mention this." The best example of this, which destroy the film and I'll always bring reference back to his Spider-Man tree mm. that Sam Raimi wanted to make a Sandman movie he wanted to make uh, a, a villain with like a great sense of duality um, and it got destroyed by bloat we need Gwen Stacy we need Venom we want another Green Goblin because that's the kind of money maker and look what, what we got mm. uh, absolutely tragically bad film so I say that pressure probably existed from them as well, but maybe he had done a good enough job to get the clout to say, look, if I'm going out, guys, this is how I'm going to do it, and I want to wrap up the story that I've sunk. What was the first one, 2007? Um, no, 14. The first one was 2014? Yeah, it's, it's oh, around a decade, yeah. I know where I'm getting that wrong. Yeah, no, you're totally <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's like 10 years of, of movie making. um, And... He, he did a, a great job, but yes, it's also a win for DC. He's going to take what he learned working with such a, a grand scope and he's going to be able to bring everything he's learned and the pitfalls and perils and possibilities all the way over to DC and he's going to produce some interesting stuff there because DC need a win. Um, I'm looking forward to The Flash. It's a shame that there seems to be this curse with leading men right now. Yeah. The Ezra Miller thing as well. I mean, the guy's a complete another scumbag. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if they're gonna if they're gonna edit it after the fact to do something to like I, I've heard rumors, you know, that they're gonna get rid of this iteration of Flash Maybe bring in a Wally West or something like that. But uh I I think like that what he's gonna produce for DC is gonna be unmissable and what like DC have kind of obviously tried to follow in the coattails of what Marvel have done. And for me, they failed. I enjoyed Wonder Woman, uh, Batman vs Superman. Not a fan, not a fan mm, at all. No, uh, agreed. And I just, I it, they need like, they keep rehashing stuff. The Snyder cut of Justice League is, is great, but it's a, like, be honest, it's a very small window audience. It is yeah. just for pure comic book fans who've read, you know, King and Come and stuff like that. Like the real, heart and Americana that DC does better than Marvel. Uh, Marvel kind of were a bit counterculture. I mean, 
what they did with Captain America and turning him into the Nomad back in the day, having to speak out, stuff like that. They presented a very mainstream focus, but there was always that stuff in the background of Marvel stuff that that was different. So with DC, I think they're going to be able to produce the, that grand epic scale that DC are known for. Mm. Um, with the the set pieces even working with Guardians, I think that is going to benefit the, DC greatly. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, I think this was a great ad for, for DC. And again, just a reminder that James Gunn hasn't missed. Again, I'm very similar to you in that, like, Guardians too. I, I love the Guardians. I love the characters. I love the banter they have. So again, like it's got a high floor, but yeah, I wasn't as mad about it as, as the other two. Um, but I, I don't think he's missed. Like even the Suicide Squad, I absolutely love the Peacemaker TV show. I think he gets oh, it. I yeah. think he gets what we want. He's one of us and he knows how to make it. He gives me kind of uh, Dave Filoni vibes where you just feel that like one of us, we're safe in his hands, you know? Um, so I think this was a great ad, but also there's, there's an opportunity for Marvel to learn here, like we spoke about, if they could use the kind of confusion with Jonathan Majors at the moment now and kind of the, the way that that may throw them into chaos and have to see them change course, that mightn't be the worst thing in the world because what they've shown here through this is that the magic is still there for Marvel. It's yeah. not, it's like every time we get kind of a, a an MCU movie which doesn't live up to the hype or the expectations that we put on it, everyone talks about superhero fatigue. And I am very skeptical about that. I don't believe in superhero fatigue. And I think this proves this because I think it's a case of if the movie's right, we'll love it. You know what I mean? But again, I think what's happening here is some of the movies are kind of going off course. Maybe the MCU is to believe in its own hype. Maybe it's to become a bit too much of a machine and they're trying to prioritize to spin too many plates at one time. And I think this is just a lesson that they can learn where it's like, no, guys, back to basics. Let's just make good stories and let's do our world building in the credits. That That's where we can do all our funny little like references and so on and teases. That's where we can do it. But let's just make sure we're telling a good story. So there's a potential for both to win. And I think ultimately that's what we all want. We would love yeah. just an amazing competitive uh, with two studios absolutely both knocking it out of the park. And James Gunn can be responsible for both uh, through inspiring with this and through obviously uh, being on the front line with the see so uh could we be potentially exciting times but i hope the right lessons are learned here uh before we wrap i do want to kind of get your thoughts on where this stands in the context we've kind of touched on this already but just whether it's the overall mcu where does it stand where does it stand kind of as a guardians movie or even in the kind of post end game phase where, where where does this kind of rank for you when you're kind of mentally doing your your mcu or guardians rankings so I think like what we touched on last time is that we said with Ant-Man and Quantumania that it's going to be better when there's a few more movies out, very similar to Age of Ultron, we touched on that. Because this is a completely different animal, that it is so self-contained, Um, I think the movie is going to stay as good as it is now and the fans are going to come back to it and have the same experience they did every other time. There was no big, wow, I didn't see that coming moments or anything like that. But I, I mean that as a positive completely. It was just a fun movie, great character development, great set pieces, great design, great action pieces. That's one thing, just real quick, without dragging out, that intro with Adam Warlock uh, when he went to nowhere and he just annihilated the place, hmm. great way to set up a powerful pseudo-villain, I guess, because he obviously he does the old face turn at the end. Yeah. So... Like, you know, that that was really good. But as far as, I like breaking it down into the sagas. Okay. So in this saga, so this phase and so far, like I said, it's an incredibly close second to No Way Home for me. Okay. okay. And I think that's 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 where it sits. Uh, as far as the Guardians movie go, um, I put it slightly ahead of volume for me. Volume um, one, sorry? Volume one. Yeah, I'll put it slightly oh, wow. ahead of volume one. Oh, wow. I, I, the reason why is because when I first saw Volume One, it, it was obviously we're still trying to figure a lot of stuff out. Um, there was, I'm I'm not like I'm not going to say I'm not the biggest Guardians fan. Everyone had a different experience to me. They were like, didn't know who the Guardians Galaxy are. Yeah, came out yeah. of the movie, fell in love with them, wanted to know more. Yeah. Whereas, like I said, I was never into the cosmic element of Marvel, which is weird because that's kind of where my bread and butter lies with so many other franchises. Mm -hmm. Um, so I went and I got what I wanted with this. I got a little bit more. 
Okay. Uh, I was I was expecting this to be a solid six and a half out of ten. I got something closer to an eight point five nine out of ten. Okay. So okay. for me, that experience is probably closer to what everyone else had as their experience when it went to the volume one. So I would rank it just above volume one. Fair. Um, as far as all the movies go as a whole. Um without thinking about it too much, it's gonna to be a top ten. Okay. Okay. Love it. Love it. This for me was the best MCU movie post endgame for me. It's my second best Guardians of the Galaxy behind the main Guardians, and only because that is incredibly yeah, high. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's just like it. It's just it, ultimately it is. And I'll I'll put it into context how much I love this movie. Okay, this is my movie. So I, ha- I keep a little letterboxed rankings list just so I can kind of mentally know where I'm ranking the movies. Okay, first in the MCU movies, number one, Infinity War. Number two, very close behind Endgame. Number three, Guardians of the Galaxy. Four, Thor Ragnarok. Five, perhaps a bit controversial, but I just love it. Captain America, the first Avenger. Six, Guardians of the Galaxy, Volume 3. And then seven, I've got No Way Home. I agree with you. I loved the first Captain America movie. Yeah, yeah. Love it, love it. Um, But like, yeah, I have it just like, that that and No Way Home are very, very close. This didn't have the audience screaming and yelling at the same time for the cameos and so on, but it had heart and so on. So again, like, it could be a toss up. It could literally be depends what I'm in the mood for watching that day, but I have them very, very close. But for me, I came out of this going, this is the best one uh, post-end game. And uh, yeah, this is definitely easily, comfortably within the top 10. I cannot wait to see this again multiple more times. I'm going to go see it again in the cinema the first chance I get. Um, and I absolutely loved it. And I loved chatting to yourself about it. And I'm glad you got so much out of oh, it as well. Yeah. Dan, we, we we need to make this a more regular thing. So I'm thinking, how about like because we only get we've only got to catch up a couple of times since we started the show. How about what's your summer looking like? How about the summer of Dan Lynham? What are you thinking? Let's talk about we've got Spider-Verse, we've got the Flash, we've got like uh Secret Invasion. We got a lot on the agenda. What do you say we kind of make this a regular deal? Let's make it a regular thing and uh like there's a lot of stuff I'm looking forward to. I'm really looking forward to Secret Invasion. That's gonna be good, and maybe that could become like we were discussing the possibility. Maybe that could become a more regular thing. Let's see how things go. Into the Spider Verse, I'm finally getting to see one of my favorite all time characters make his debut on the big screen. And even though we've got a one quarter of a second shot of him, let's go, Scarlet Spider. I can't feckin' wait. Love it, love it. Summer of Dan Lynham coming your way very shortly on uh, page 180. So stay tuned for that, Dan Lynham. Always a pleasure. And uh, chat very, very soon.